This is For the Better, a podcast for those working to affect change within their team, organization, or community. I'm your host, Ben Cash. Thanks for tuning into the podcast, where we talk with leaders and change makers from purpose driven organizations and discuss the great things that, that they're doing. This podcast is produced by Reason One, a full service digital agency helping those who do good do better. Today's guest is Jesse Blum, Executive Director of the Green Heart Project here in Charleston, South Carolina. Welcome, Jesse. Thanks, Ben. Happy to be here. Hey, I got my, uh, my uh, Green Heart swag on representing. That's right. That one's from uh, 2018, maybe. Oh, this is, I think I've got two of them. I've got one from like early days uh, that I got from Drew Harrison. And uh, my wife once actually tried to throw it out. I found it and like I was taking some stuff to Goodwill and I found it in there. I was so mad um, because it's like it's it's my like favorite T-shirt. Uh, I think I've even told you that I I uh, the reason one shirts that we have. I was like, it's got to be like the green heart shirt with the big the big emblem. So right. thanks for the great swag, man. <laughs> Very welcome. <laughs> um, so for those who aren't aware, what's Green Heart Project? Oh, the Green Heart Project is a nonprofit organization based in Charleston, South Carolina. Uh, we build school gardens, very simply. So we work with schools. Um, we put gardens in at the schools, and we use them as outdoor classrooms. So the kids in the gardens, they learn how to grow food. So they're food gardens. They grow the food, um, learn about that growing process and how it connects to what they're learning in the classroom. They also learn how to harvest the food and how to cook it. So basically from seed to plate, um, they're learning about that growing process. So that's the very simple nature of what the Green Heart Project does. Yeah. But it's all that's and that's the activity. But really, the end goal of the Green Heart Project is to um, grow these students into community members who know and care more about their own health and the environment and how to work with one another to accomplish something positive. And so the very end goal is, is cultivating a community of people with a, with a shared set of values. Oh, that's, that's great. Yeah, I think that's, people often don't get the, the larger uh, benefits uh, of, of the project and what it, what it means. It's not just growing vegetables, but it's yeah. actually, you know, growing minds and growing hearts and yeah. yeah well, what we say the, is the food is a vehicle. The food's a vehicle for education and so it's a vehicle for health and it's a vehicle for, for building relationships with people. Oh, love that. Mm -hmm. Love that. It's, yeah. it's why I've always been a fan of the, of the project of all these years. Yeah. Um, so one of the reasons that I wanted to interview you, Jesse, besides just you're a cool dude and you're doing some great things is that, you and I both spoke at Pecha Kucha. Actually, I've got the uh, poster of it, I think, here in my room. It was Pecha Kucha 34 okay. a couple of years ago. I don't know, maybe 2000. I want to say 19. 19. 18, 19 know, like okay. before, the, before the, uh, you know, BP. Yeah. You know what happened, right? <laughs> um, and what was great about that was that, like, we, you were relatively new to Green Heart, right? Uh, and we're talking about your your story, how you got there and all these things. And, and I was also talking about my story of, of change and where I was hoping to take the the agency as being a vehicle for, you know, force for good. And it was sort of this I recall us kind of going, uh, OK, let's let's check in in a year and see how we're doing. Right. 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 Uh, and of course, COVID was like, hold my beer. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I so I was really I was really struck by your your story in that. And I'm uh, I know it, it Green Heart was was not your first rodeo. It's it's. Um, it was sort of you, it, your past led to that. And so why where did this start for you? Why urban agriculture? Yeah, so good question, Ben. Um, I, I've always been drawn to nature. All right. So I would say that's the very, very start of it. So I'm, I'm native to, uh, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, spent my summers up in Northern Wisconsin. And I learned, I learned to be in the outdoors. I went to a canoeing camp during the summers, uh, when I was growing up and on these canoeing trips, you go out, you spend days at a time out in the wilderness with a small group of people, usually 
between four to eight people. And you just learn how to live with one another and you learn how to live in nature. And those experiences were, were really, really um, impactful on me from a, from a young age. I feel, like, I feel like I learned how to be a human you know, through those experiences, much more so than going to school. I didn't have much of an affinity for school. I didn't have much connection with my neighborhood. You know, for me, it was going out to connect with nature that really helped me um, develop my, my identity and my sense of self and my, my connection to the world. And so uh, as I grew older, I thought that that's what I wanted to do when I grew up. I thought that I wanted to lead canoe trips for young people so that they could have similar experiences to me. And I did that for a short while. Um, I would say ages 18 to uh, 23 or so. That was like, that was my thing that I did for a while during summers, during college. And then after college, I did it for a good bit. And uh, one thing I started canoeing or canoeing. Like out, yeah. Yeah. Canoeing, leading canoe trips. And then that led to other things, you know, um, uh, the camp I went to is a YMCA camp. It, it was, it was a phenomenal it's a phenomenal place. It's called Camp Manitouche YNCA. And they've taken the lessons that they have learned through canoe trips and they've created a formula and applied it to leadership development. And they got this whole theory framework and this whole sort of series of activities you can go through with groups that try to recreate essentially what happens on a wilderness trip with a group of people. So it could be a company, it could be a school group. Um, you know, you go through a multi day experience, problem solving you know, learning about each other. Um, oh, wow. And uh, so, so through that process, I also got to learn a little bit more about uh, group development and leadership development. And I was yeah. fascinated by all of it. Did you, sorry, when you were, when you were doing it the, yeah. initially before that, was there someone that did the same thing for you? That was sort of like a, a, a mentor or somebody that was leading that? Absolutely. And it, yeah. you know, it, it was the guy who ran the leadership uh, program at that camp. He was kind of like a sage old guy. Okay. Um, he was, he was, he was native to northern Wisconsin, but he kind of, you know, I don't know what his relationship with the, with the, uh, with the Ojibwe nation was. He was a, he was a white guy. He wasn't a native guy, but yeah. he, he was familiar with a lot of the old native wisdom um, in that part of the country. And he incorporated it into his leadership development work. Anyway, great guy. Just yeah. retired. Mark, Mark Zanoni. I'll give him a shout out. Hey, Mark. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, learned ab about essentially um, le leading leadership development processes, you know, and, uh, and, and, I, and I, I sort of, I sort of, and this is a long story, Ben, so no, it's, it's fast, okay. forward, in, me, man, fast forward me if you want, but we, uh, I ended up taking a job back in Milwaukee, my hometown, um, uh, doing leadership development work with high school kids. We were working with uh, private schools from around the country and around the world. And we'd take small groups of kids from these private schools and put them into outdoor environments. We did a sailing trip where the kids would get on a sailboat and sail around for a few days. Mm. Um, there was a trip in New Mexico we did where the kids would go climb mountains in New Mexico, stay at a retreat center, eat vegetarian food, and sort of, you know, really get out there. And yeah. then the, the, the last one, uh, and this, this is a sequence of experiences. The last one was uh, they, we traveled to Costa Rica and visited a, a university there dedicated to sustainable agriculture called ah. Earth, Earth University was the name of the university. So I found myself, so, you know, I, 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 I loved the outdoors part of it. I loved the leadership development part of it. I was found myself at a two person nonprofit organization. So I was number two out of two people. I basically learned how to run a nonprofit. It was a startup nonprofit. So I learned all the administration and management behind. And this the is the one in Costa Rica? Uh, this is Milwaukee. It's based out of Milwaukee. Oh, this is the one in Milwaukee. Oh, but you based went to out of Milwaukee. Yeah. But we would we would send kids. We would send kids all over the place. You know, to these different programs. So, so learn how to do that and learn how to uh, manage a nonprofit and at the same time. But I was still dissatisfied. You know, after doing that for a couple of years, and the reason Ben was, and with and with the canoe trips too, I started feeling this with the canoe trips, and then I it continued with this other group that I was with is we were reaching like we were reaching to 1%, right? Or the half percent or the 1% of the population that could afford these experiences. Yeah. And, yeah. and it was, it was during this time that I was kind of, you know, becoming more self-aware and recognizing that, Hey, 
you know, I'm facilitating all of these experiences with these one percenters. Am I a one percenter? You know, I'm sort of getting getting self-reflective, you know, and uh, and I became convinced that, you know, that I wanted to I wanted everybody to have this type of experience that these kids are having. Yeah. And I was realizing that it was it was not possible in that format. It was also not possible in the format that I grew up in. You know, while canoe trips are awesome, they're just they're just not so accessible to people. And so I, I made that realization then before I knew anything about urban farming or anything like that. And you were like early 20s at that point? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was, wow. I was 20. Yeah. I was probably 20. Uh, I was probably 25, 24, 25 or stuff. It's a pretty good realization for uh, 20 something. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I was like, I, I was, I was convinced. I was like, yeah. you know, I, 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 I know what I want to do, but this is just not working. And, and, and yeah. I, you know, but I started getting a vision of, 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 of what it was that I wanted to do, and, and it really crystallized uh, when I made these re- repeat visits to Costa Rica to this university there called Earth University, and that's a really special place. Um, mm. They, it's a university that teaches sustainable agriculture. They, they give four-year degrees, undergraduate degrees in agronomy, which is soil science. They recruit kids from all over the world, but they focus on the tropics. So you get kids from the Caribbean, from uh, uh, West and East Africa, from Southeast Asia, tropical regions around the world. And they mostly recruit from small, rural, poor communities. So you get these kids and, and, and almost all of them are on scholarship. So they get big money from USAID and Kellogg Foundation and this and that. So these kids are on scholarship. And so you get these. these so this is not the one percent. This is so the they, they take that knowledge and they take it back to That's the idea. their home country, their home That's community. The idea. Yeah, yeah. So you get these. So, 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 so there you're reaching the 99 percent. You know, you're right. teaching them real practical skills that they can use. And they not only teach the skills, they learn how to, they teach how to, the, how to use those skills for community development and for economic oh, development. Wow. So every student that goes through there um, goes through a, a business startup. They get a $10,000 loan from the university and they start their own business product. And it's usually a value added food product. And wow. so, so they learn business development skills as they go. They learn how to consult with community members to undertake projects that benefit the entire community. And so they, they, they I, that really lit a fire under me seeing that yeah. happen. And I was like, this is it. This is it. This is how you take n- experiences with nature, which is the agriculture. This is how you apply it through a broad swath of the community by teaching, you know, economic development and community development through these practices. And it was like, this is what I want to do. And that yeah. was it. That, that sold me. And so I came back to Milwaukee and I remember I was like, you know, I was like, where do, where do I start? <laughs> and and uh and it was not long after that it was like literally a week or two after that my mom gave me a magazine and she she sort of folded a page on that magazine and she said you should read this you know you might you might like reading this article and it was an article about an urban farmer in Milwaukee named Will Allen who was basically doing the same thing and he was targeting young kids uh from the north side of Milwaukee in the neighborhood where he was and his by, you know, at that time, I didn't know what a food desert was. A lot of people didn't know what a food desert was, right. but he was sort of educating people about what it looks like to live in a neighborhood where there's no zero healthy food options and how you can grow your own food and help to address some of those problems. But in the process, develop a sense of dignity, of self-worth. Um, of really, you know, it's really what it is, is positive activity, positive, healthy activity wow. that you can, um, you know, invest yourself into. Will Allen became a world famous urban farmer over a short period of time. Um, he was, you know, recognized by the Obama White House, the, the Clinton Global Initiative sent him over to Zimbabwe. So here in uh, Milwaukee, I had this, like, we had this all-star urban farmer. And, um, Went over, volunteered over there for a little bit, and then so you, so you then you, so you read the article, and then you actually were like, I'm going to go. And I'm like, I'm going to go. <laughs> how how long after you saw this article? Did like how fast did this happen? It must have been the, like the next week, right? I must have looked. Oh, my, you know, you know, how do I get involved? You know, there's probably volunteer information I found. I, I show up probably next week. Man on a mission. Yeah, and so and so I'm there now. I'm a, now I'm shoveling wood chips into a wheelbarrow, and um, you know, moving wood chips around the this farm on the north side of Milwaukee. 
And uh, pretty soon I discovered that there are other people in this sort of strange community of practice that is urban farming in Milwaukee. And um, that's where I met the people at Sweetwater. So Sweetwater was okay. my first opportunity for employment in uh, urban agriculture. And I showed up at Sweetwater and they had started a farm on the south side of Milwaukee. And at this farm, then they were uh, uh, inviting schools and schools would show up in their school buses and get off the school bus and come see the farm. But they didn't have any program for the kids. They would, the kids would just sort of walk around and check yeah. things out. And so I was able to, you know, use my background in experiential education to formulate a program. And that was the start of it all. So worked at Sweetwater for a few years, built up an education program with them doing urban farming and education, you know, was able to sort of use that as an opportunity to get out of town, get to Baltimore to work for uh, the university there or Johns Hopkins university. They were hiring somebody to do something similar. They had a little farm that they wanted to use for education. So I did that. And then, so you, uh, so you said that Johns Hopkins, so they that was a that's, bit of a jump. That's, that's, know, kind of, that's you know, I, I think I've heard of Johns Hopkins, <laughs> maybe. Yeah. Uh, but like, I mean, uh, how developed was it at that point? Well, you, it was so the, the, the reason that that was that that would work for me is there's a specific type of agriculture which is aquaponics, the cultivation of fish and vegetables in a water system. Very specific okay. type of farming that I yeah. had gained expertise in over those years with Sweetwater. They wanted somebody to do this educational aquaponics farm. And there's only so many of us out there to do that. So I raised my hand, got a job, went went out to Baltimore, brought my family out there. And then um, I worked for them for a couple of years. But what I really wanted to do is get back into the community. Because when you're at a university, you're kind of separated in a way from what's happening in the community. And and that's when I was was looking again. And that's when uh, I found that Greenheart in Charleston, South Carolina, where I had never imagined (laughs) I might move to yeah you know let, uh, visit let alone move to i mean you're gonna, you're I, gonna trade your canoe for a kayak of course <laughs> <laughs> yeah and then uh greenheart's looking for a director and you know i sort of you know what convinced my wife is she grew up in miami florida so you know i convinced my wife that well we're, and she was trying to get back to warmer climates by the sea and i was able to convince her and came down here to charleston now it's three and a half years ago so that's kind of my a little bit of my backstory, you know, there's, of course, there's a lot of stuff along the way. I would yeah. say my, uh, my greatest inspiration along that whole journey is, uh, you know, watching students get um, really uh, uh, a spark ignited in them in terms of interest and, and uh, you know, a, a, a world of opportunity really opens up when you figure out that you can make a positive impact through something as simple as growing, growing yeah. plants. Yeah. But and I'm curious about that because you know, um, there, I mean, there's so many metaphors here. This is like yeah. one giant metaphor ball. I'm going to try to contain myself. Yeah. But like, um, it sounds like it, like you're. There's one aspect of setting up the environment and the opportunity for this to grow, for this to happen, right? Yeah. But you also were talking earlier about like um, uh, how you learned a lot of leadership skills and being a leader, and you know. What does that look? What does leadership look like in that kind of environment? Oh, okay. So, uh, so let me talk maybe about like the what the students experience yeah, in yeah. the garden, and that'll lead me to maybe talk a little bit about leadership. So, yeah, sure. sure. Uh, one thing that I found over the years in these projects, and, and you see it with Greenheart in Charleston, that you know the teacher is trying to teach um, English and math and you know whatever academic subject they're trying to teach in the classroom. They're lucky, I think, or they're good and talented, probably a little bit of both, if they find a way to teach teamwork and, okay. um, you know, cooperation and, um, you know, and leadership in a classroom environment. Because, like you mentioned, the physical environment, physical environments in the classroom is not necessarily structured in a way to facilitate right. that. Yeah, or more requires- stand and deliver. you got the one person at the top and you've got your, yeah, very... <laughs> exactly. uh, what, um, I don't know, uh, different, you know, a system from a different era. <laughs> you got it. You got it. And so yeah. juxtapose that with the garden, you know, you're out in the garden with kids and you gather around the garden bed to look uh, at what's, yeah. what's growing in the garden. So we, we, at every green heart lesson, you do a circle up. So you do a, a big group circle up and you've got the 15, 20 kids, however many, you know, you're all looking at each other and you're all in even playing field and you're all standing yeah. up. And then you go to these small group 
breakouts and you're circled up and you're working together and, you know, you're tossing something back and forth in order to do the work in the garden, the hands-on work. So I think the, the environment and the activity is more set up for working together and, yeah. uh, uh, but, um, you know, practicing teamwork. And when, when we talk with the teachers and with the principals at the schools about, you know, how Greenheart really makes an impact, they bring up things like the kids are learning how to work together in the garden. Um, so that's one thing. And I think, you know, leadership, in my experience, really spawns from teamwork, right? So if you learn how to work with each other on a team, you can start to figure out what effective in terms of helping your helping your team move in a certain direction. So you might figure out that you're really good at talking and giving directions. You might figure out that you're really good at doing hard work and the hard work done. And so right. we work with the kids on focusing on what works for them, you know? And I, I, want to, I want you to keep going on this thread, but I just have one sort of question about what you just shared, which is, yeah. uh, so you're, you know, you, you know, you're talking about, you know, when you put this in the school, you, 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 they have math teachers and the science teachers and all these kind of things. And, and, and those traditional sort of classroom settings, yeah. when you've implemented a program and you've created that kind of new environment and you're creating those, that teamwork in those classes, have the other teachers come to you and said, hey, I'm noticing a, a change in behavior or attitude or like, how is your work affecting the, 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 the traditional classrooms? Yeah, well, you know, Yes, we do have teachers that come back and, and, and tell us that. And, it, you know, it's specific teachers who are really, yeah. you know, keen on, uh, you know, finding, uh, you know, finding those little things that spark their students' interest. And it's specific students that I think gravitate towards this type of activity, right? So um, I'll, I can truthfully say that I think all students benefit from time in the garden, but there's a yeah. select few that really get into it. Um, and it's those students where you see their time in the garden has an impact on their attendance at school. You got right. kids when it's green heart day, we do green heart usually one day a week when it's green heart day, they show up with their green heart shirt. You know, they're ready to rock and roll. Um, and those are the students that take what they grew in the garden and ask their parents to buy that food that they grew in the garden from the grocery store so they can cook it at home in the same way that we cooked it at green heart. Right. And those are the students who during the pandemic said, we're at home now. I don't have my green heart garden at school. Let's build a garden at home. You know, so there are a select few students that really internalize yeah. this um, garden work and, and make it theirs. And that's, that's my ultimate goal, Ben. That's, that's like, that's me, you know, that's right. Yeah. yeah. For me, that was me at canoeing, you know, I want, right. I want to have the garden be that for some of our, our students that it really sparks a fire in them. And is that the, you know, that maybe that aspect of leadership is not necessarily like that you are in the classroom standing and delivering. And then what I think a lot of uh, people, you know, in movies or, you know, sort of think of it's the, it's the person in the front of the class who's sort of like charging the way when really it's just someone who is passionate about something and leading with that passion and letting and seeing others follow. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's my inspiration in my work, Ben. And so, you know, when, when we're building our team at Greenheart, you know, I'm looking for people who uh, are able to inspire that in others. Yeah. You know, um, based on their work in the garden. So. So, um, yeah, I don't know where you want to go from here. Yeah, well, I mean, it's I, I, such a great story. And, and I, I kind of want to just uh, pick up on what you left here, which is um, I'm. You said there was there was like a student or some students or whatever that that you've seen where it really sparks. Yeah. I mean, do you, do you have any particular stories or you know? Uh, I mean, this is ultimately yeah. our your work is not about you. I mean, you're a talented dude, but like it's yeah. it's those students that you're working with that I think you 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 know you really are really about. Yeah, I I want to tell you about one student in particular. Um, so when I showed up at Greenheart. Um, you know how if you work for a company or, or, an, or an organization, you kind of have that one stock photo that you use everywhere. It's on your brochure and it's on your website. Yeah, sure, and that sure. sort of thing. We had this one stock photo and there's a, there's a green heart teacher wearing a green heart t-shirt. And then there's a green heart student wearing a green heart t-shirt. And that green heart student is 
raising his hand like really vigorously, right? He's ready to answer a question that the teacher asked him in the garden. Um, I never knew who that kid was until, so we just started a high school internship program where we're hiring high school kids to work for Greenheart during the summer. And a couple of years ago, we ran our first high school internship program. <laughs> and one of the applicants, his name is Aaron, he came into the office for his interview and he pointed up at the wall and he said, that's me, you know, that, and <laughs> so that, that, that was Aaron. Aaron had come back, you know, and he was in that picture. He was in third grade at Mitchell elementary school. Oh, wow. And, and since that time he had gone through middle school and then entered in high school. Um, he's at Charleston charter school for math and science, which is right here on King street. And, uh, and he was, he was, he was, he was, uh, certain that he was going to get the job with us because, <laughs> because, because yeah. or, our, or pay me some royalties for my, for your stock photo. Right. It was our poster child. And, uh, and, and sure enough, he's, he, he was, he was one of our best interns. He came back for a second year last year and we even hired him on in the school year, uh, oh, this wow. year to work for us. He comes in after school and he works for us. Right. So this, this guy, Aaron is one of those students who caught fire, you know, Greenheart did something for him. And I think what it did for him, because, when you talk to him, it's not about the garden. He doesn't want to, you know, do green heart because he wants to grow food in the garden. He wants to do green heart because he wants to have a positive activity to do with other people that he really enjoys. Yeah. And, and that's what keeps drawing him back. And, you know, he's got, he's got dreams of doing a computer. Uh, I don't even know the words for it. He likes to build computers. Okay. So like I mean, that's his your engineering or something. There you go. There you go. That's yeah. his interest. And he's always, he's always using his paychecks from Greenheart to go buy computer parts and build computers at home. So <laughs> it's not the gardening and the food. It's the, it's, it's the people. It's that sense of community that we're trying right. to build that keeps bringing them back. We've got this community that we're trying to support these kids as they grow. And, uh, you know, he lives in the neighborhood. He lives over here uh, um, on the east side and he walks to school and, you know, he's, he, he's, a, he's a hard worker and he is like, he's kind of like the, you know, the, the, and he, he embodies what I'm hoping we can, continue to do year after year is inspire the kids when they're young and give them an opportunity to keep growing and maturing with us as they get older um, so that they can then go on to inspire. You know? Wow. Yeah. So that's, 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 that's a true yeah, story. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's, that's sure. kind of the one, that's kind of the one. And, you know, one of the things we do with the, with the intern is we try to identify you know, for whom the internship is going to be a transformational experience. That's how, that's how we phrase right. it. Because, you know, we could open up this internship program. We get all sorts of applicants and some of them might apply for our internship. They might apply for, you know, band camp. They might apply for, you know, all of these other experiences that might be available to them. We are really looking for those students that, you know, this is kind of a, it's a unique opportunity for them. They don't have other experiences like this. That those are the candidates that we're going for. So yeah. we are looking, you know, I mean, you're looking for young Jesse's. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah that are, that are yeah. connecting the dots yeah. that are connecting yeah. the dots. And yeah. 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 You got it. Yeah. So that, that, that's the, that's the impact that we're looking to have. And really that's kind of, you know, you said the podcast is about change, right. And, yeah. and I, I would say that's kind of our theory of change, if you will, is, um, is inspire the person you know so that's that is so others yeah it's so right and and you know i uh it's you know um so i'm leading a team leading you know at the agency and and i you know it's it's um it's it's a challenge right like leadership is a challenge because you know i know sometimes i'm i'm headstrong i want to i want to get somewhere i want to change things, et cetera. And I'm, I'm, uh, you know, uh, to the detriment sometimes of my colleagues, I'm like, I have so many ideas. I'm so optimistic and passionate about things that it's, it's hard for me to, to get out of the way sometimes. Mm -hmm. And the, the thing that I and sort of this mantra, I actually have this little email reminder. That's like a, it's like an event, event I put in my calendar that, that sends a description for the reminder. And every day it reminds me that it's basically like my job is to actually help them think creatively and help them do those things and just get the hell out of the way. Yeah. 
you know, it's, it's hard. It's a hard balance, but um, yeah. some of the best ideas, some of the best things that we've done have just have been because someone had the, had the space yeah. to, to do it. Yeah, yeah. And fail a little bit. And, and fail, yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. <laughs> let, let them fail. I mean, um, um, I, I, when I came in, I interviewed for this job with Greenheart. I, I told my interviewers that uh, it was my goal to be replaced. We call the kids that we work with, we call them our Greenheart buddies. Well, we got the little Greenheart buddies and we got the big Greenheart buddies. We're big Greenheart buddies. You're a big Greenheart buddy, Ben. And the, the, the students are the little Greenheart buddies. I told them that my goal was for a little Greenheart buddy to basically take my place, you know, when it was time. Um, we, Greenheart started 12, 13 years ago now. So those third graders, which was Aaron in the photo with his hand up, you know, they are now 18, 19 years old, you know, but as soon as it's time, you know, I don't so know. You how want, we're... you want him, you want Aaron to take your job. I mean, well, maybe, not, maybe that's you know, metaphor, or, be, or is that, yeah, or you, is that no, literal? Are you like, no, listen, listen, I'm not like, I'm not like <laughs> Fidel Castro and sort of picking my successor here, but um, Aaron, if you're listening, Aaron, if you're listening, <laughs> take him out, man, come for his job. So uh, whether, you know, Yes, it absolutely could be Aaron. I say it's literal in the sense that I literally um, am uh, striving for that to happen. Right. You know, um, and so, yes, I do very much want a little green heart buddy to take my my place. Um, right. that's, so that's that's the ultimate goal. Yeah. Um, well, so you thought this was about gardens or maybe not. I thought, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's about t-shirts, man. Um, it's all it's all about the swag, man. I really just like Greenheart because you've got great swag. I saw those those Greenheart masks, you know, uh, that you've got. Like those are awesome, you know. Uh, yeah, let's go to you know greenheartse.org uh, or order some there you go. swag. I mean, yeah, we just yeah. got some hooded sweatshirts in and that sort of thing. Oh, okay. Oh, actually, I need to get one of those. Uh, all right, you gotta, you gotta set me up. Um, so. You, you tell, like, this is such an inspiring story. I mean, both personally and the organization. Uh, and it just, it, it like, when I imagine it, it's just, you're like, you know, just trolloping through the, to this journey <laughs> and it's all roses and everything. Right. But I, but I know like if, if, if you're, if you're a change junkie or you change, have the change mindset, I know there's been some, some obstacles or some things all the way, you know, your, your mom's not just going to hand you the, the right thing earmarked every every time you, you for that next thing like what's what's been some of the tough things about change or about this journey for you yeah well i would say personally um you know uprooting and moving the family has been a big big part of this journey for me you know finding ourselves in charleston has, it hasn't been an easy journey you know we had uproot from our hometown milwaukee where we started our family yeah in order to make that trip out to baltimore so that was a big leap you know like just having faith and trusting that what was on the other side was going to somehow propel yeah. us towards something that was better. You know, so I would say, yeah. I, and then, and then again, Baltimore to Charleston, but we were sort of a little bit broken in by that time, but yeah. you know, mo moving. And I think, again, you could think about that literally or figuratively, right. Just yeah. getting off, getting off of dead center and moving. Um, it was a huge challenge that we faced along the way. And I think we're still facing the consequences of it like but in the end you know and again we're talking about this inspiration thing but i'm following yeah. that inspiration and just trying to you know find that next bit and then i would say on a you know when it comes to actually doing the work and challenges i find there i would say you know maybe just like any organization but i i find that it's i find that it's uh specifically organ uh, organizations like Greenheart where uh, it's kind of everybody's pet by everybody. I mean, all of the employees and even sometimes volunteers and board members, but it's kind of everybody's right. passion project, you know, like, um, I, and I think that's what kind of sets it apart. Maybe, maybe, it, maybe it's common to nonprofits. I'm sure you find it in some companies as well, but I feel like specifically nonprofits, specifically something as unique as green heart, like everybody is here because they love gardens and kids and mm -hmm. green heart. And when you have a group of people that's all driven by their own passion, you can do great things and it can be very inspiring, but you can also, it also can result in big conflict. And, and because everybody sort of, 
is so emotionally invested in the work. So I guess right. that's, that's the big thing that I continue to find is that people doing the work are so emotionally invested. It becomes, it's always challenging to organize as a team because, you know, everybody is, when, when you have such emotional investment, any change, getting back to that theme of change, any change that you yeah. make can challenge somebody's emotional investment, investment because you have to be willing to let go of your attachment to a specific way we build a garden or a specific way we yeah, teach right. a kid, you know, that you might feel strongly about, but it might not be in the best interest of our organizing efforts. And so trying to create a formal structure and an organizational structure around something that that's a passion project for everybody is challenging, yeah. you know? So, so it, it becomes, it becomes a, a, a big emotional investment. Let me say. Yeah. And I think back to you sort of when, you know, you were passionate doing the canoeing stuff, right. You had this sense, but then at a certain point, your passion was different than those around you. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I, and that's, I know as far as like leading an organization, that's, often the challenging thing, whether you're getting your buddies, your green heart buddies, whether you're hiring employees or whatever it is, that everybody's rowing in the same direction. Sorry, not, not to use it, <laughs> no pun intended. Um, but, uh, and like, how do you, how do you know when to, when it's right, when it's wrong, when it, when it's, when it's time to move on, like what, both yourself and for the people that are around you, right? Mm-hmm. How's that? What's that been like for you? Ben, that's a question that I keep asking myself every day. <laughs> <laughs> every day. How do we, how do we do this? You know, um, um, how, how do we do it then? Um, I would say, you know, I'm trying to get better every day at giving people their duties and responsibilities and also re almost redefining on a weekly basis for myself, what are my duties and responsibilities? And, and one way that I phrased it um, for an employee recently was, what does the Green Heart Project need me to do today? Or, you know, how does the Green Heart Project need to be spending my time today? And, and I think in that way, you kind of are able to step outside yourself a little bit and, you know, defer to the needs of the organization. And I think one of the ways to do that is set up really clear duties. So while right. I love, personally, I can speak to this personally, I love, gardening. I love, I also love teaching students. I also love packaging produce for the market that we have. You know, I also love, you know, I love all of these different things that we do, but I can't do it all. So really getting clear about, okay, what, you know, what am I really going to focus on and Uh, putting, putting each of my employees in a position where they can set boundaries for themselves. And And then I have to play a bit of a referee sometimes, you know, okay. I know you like doing this other thing, but this is somebody else's thing. So I'm trying to get better at that. Yeah. And it's so, you know, I think back to our, our Pachacucha talks, right. And that, and you're, there are like, I started this business um, because I really liked the work. I love creating things. I love the creative process. And as the business grew, I hired people like I gave this one thing that I liked over to this person. I gave this thing I like. And eventually I sort of was like, find myself like, oh, shit, I have nothing. I've given all those things away. And and I got to find my new passion right now. The business was my like, this is my livelihood. And it's what so I had I was uh, I couldn't go chase. And I also had a family and I can't go chasing the next thing. Right. And I think this uh, change has its limitations. Right. Um, but I've had to find a new passion, uh, in leadership, in, uh, setting that vision and trying to get others on board. And it's, it's, um, man, it's a tough road because it's like, I, you know, you gotta put those 10,000 hours in, right. You gotta like, and, it, and until you. Like, I feel like I'm always faking it (laughs) Mm -hmm. Uh, because it's so new uh, that it's harder to enjoy it. But, you know, I don't know. You get those wins every now and then. But like, what are some of the new things that that you think you're like replacing or letting go? Or or, do do you experience that? Or are you just like this passionate dude who's just like, I love everything. And I'm I'm like, (laughs) (laughs) no, I'm kind of where you are, Ben. I've kind of, you know, tried to give everything away. 
And uh, <laughs> really, really. And, you know, so I guess one thing that really gets me going, just like, you know, just like I love seeing the, the spark and the passion in the kids yeah. that really take on gardening. I love seeing that spark and that passion in my employees when they grab a hold of something yeah. that I used to do or that I used to be good at and do it in their own way. And like you said, stepping out of the way. So, you know, I would say that that is probably that is probably the biggest challenge that I deal with. And one of the biggest things I'm trying to get better at every day. And then as a result, and I'm sure you see this too, you know, your experiences yeah. too, as a leader, you know, naturally I become more of a salesperson with, you know, you try to get people to get good at everything that they do at Green Heart. And now I just go out and I tell other people how great Green Heart is. You know, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm yeah. not doing it anymore and everybody else is doing yeah. it. I can tell other people how great it is. The you passion know? for cheerleading, right? There you go. Yeah. yeah. There you go. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I, I, I'm very much in, that's the trench that I'm in right now, is, right. is trying to figure out how to transition myself uh, out of the activities yeah. that I love so much and yeah. into a new new space where I'm, a cheerleader, yeah. a, a, re a referee sometimes. You know, <laughs> exactly. Right. Yeah. Oh man. If you, if you figure it out, let me know, please. Okay. <laughs> Cause, cause, cause yeah. I, yeah. Oh goodness. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so we're, we're getting close to time here, but I, I, uh, I did have one thing I wanted to ask because, um, you know, I I've seen, I keep seeing aspects of this, you know, the new urban farm, uh, that you're, that you've been building, and I, because of the pandemic, I just haven't gotten out as much and I'm, and I'm, and I'm can't wait to go experience it. But I, um, what's, tell me about the, 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 the urban farm and what's, what's that, how's, where's that taking Greenheart? So the urban farm, that's, that was the big project that, that they had on the table with Greenheart when I came in. And so it's a half acre urban farm in downtown Charleston on King street, 900 King street. And we built it in 2020. So it's been a year and a half now. We're in our second year of growing there. It's a school garden for three schools on the block. Four schools now. Actually, there's a new school in, uh, in, in the area. They can all walk there and use it as their garden. It's in the middle of a residential community um, that belongs to the housing authority. So it's a workforce housing, affordable okay. housing. A lot of them are seniors. So there's a lot of senior housing there and then workforce housing people who are in the and workforce. This was a partnership with local government, whereas Housing the other ones are partnerships with the schools. Is that yeah, is there a difference there? Uh, oh, yeah, very much so. Yeah, housing working on housing authority properties is different than working with the schools. But yeah, you know they're both yeah they're both sort of big uh, public institutions. So, yeah, uh, for better or for worse. And um, but uh, no, it's a great spot. You know, that we we've, we very much are trying to create community buy-in. Uh, it's essential to any time you build a garden in a residential neighborhood. You know, the neighbors have to sort of feel like it's theirs, and so the farm very much is. It belongs to the community. Um, yeah. The folks who live there have a chance to garden there. So we got the school gardens, and we got some beds that are for the schools, some beds for the community members to garden there. And then what really brings people out is we do a, a weekly market. Um, so every Thursday. Uh, we we sell the vegetables that we grow it, at the farm and we do a pay what you can oh, scale. Awesome. So, you know, being a affordable housing, you've got people of limited income, you know, limited means. Right. And that re that reflects a lot of the neighborhood in Upper Peninsula while the Upper Peninsula is changing, gentrifying really quickly. You know, a lot of people of higher income coming in. It still is a predominantly lower income neighborhood, uh, especially in North, North Central where we're at. Right. Um, and so everything's pay what you can. So we got, so, you know, most people pay something, pay a dollar, pay five bucks, you know, whatever you have yeah. available for your veggies. Some people don't pay, but then other people who can pay come in and they, then they pay for their veggies. And, and some people give a little extra and we, we balance it out. So the, the market is really what, what brings people out. Um, so that's on Thursdays. And if anybody here is listening, uh, on a Thursday afternoon, come by 900 King street, get, get your fresh veggies. You garden fresh veggies. I love it. Uh, yeah. Well, so that's a good cue to like, what are some things that people can do to, to volunteer or support Greenheart? Yeah. Yeah. You know, coming to the market is really a, a easy, okay. I mean, my, in my mind, an uh, easy way. Come by, get your veggies okay. on Thursday afternoon. Uh, we are volunteer driven, volunteer based. We take volunteers on Thursday afternoons to work out in the garden during the market. We okay. take volunteers on Thursday mornings to harvest the veggies for market. 
We got all sorts of other volunteers. So okay. just go to our web website and figure it out. Greenheartsc.org. Plug, exactly. plug. Yeah, yeah. Get some, get some good swag. Uh, yeah. Get, yeah, that's get, why your, get your garden on. Um, this is such a, this is so great. I remember you and I had dinner actually uh, yeah. at Rue de Jean right. right before we both went on to, to speak at Pecha Kucha. And I remember having a similar kind of enjoyable conversation. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm so glad we're getting to reconnect. Um, and, uh, I just, before like a last question, last two questions here for you. Um, you've, you've, you had a long journey, uh, a long way to go still. Um, you probably learned a lot of lessons, uh, in those communities that you've served. What's, whether it's urban agriculture or, or anything, what, like, what is one lesson that you've learned that you think, you know, what is something people can do if they want to also be good community members, good servants? Yeah. Um, you know, w- one reason I like gardening so much is because literally anybody can do it anywhere. Even if you don't have any yard space, you could put pots on your porch. You can put, uh, uh, you know, you can grow sprouts in your kitchen, you know, so okay. you, you can, you can do something no matter how small. Uh, and so that's something that I, that, that, that's one of Will Allen's, Will Allen's that farmer back in Milwaukee. I told you right, right. that's something that he would, he would say over and over and over again, he's like, do something no matter how small. And he was talking specifically about urban gardening and urban farming. Right. Um, and you know, you can start literally start you super small and anybody can, um, but sort of zooming out from that. One thing that I've learned is, uh, you know, if you do something that you feel really, uh, inspired about and, and passionate about you know other people are going to come find you so uh, one part of my story i didn't talk about which is i think an important link between my canoeing and my mm-hmm. gardening okay it seems it seems an unlikely connection but there is there's bring, a connection point bring it bring it home for us there's, jesse there's bring it home <laughs> i when i was in milwaukee before was it before or after will Allen, will Allen? i don't know i started volunteering at a at a school where they built boats. So the high school kids were building boats uh, at the mm. school. We were building canoes, we were building rowboats. And there were a couple of really talented and really inspired woodshop teachers there. I didn't know anything about building boats. I didn't know anything about woodshops. I loved boats. And so I just showed up at the school and I said, hey, I wanna help. And, and it was at that school that I learned about across the river, there was this urban farm um, which was Sweetwater, which is my, my first okay. place of employment around, around urban gardening. So I think the one lesson that I'm trying to, uh, w- that I'm trying to pass on there is, you know, I've, I found other people who were inspired to do work and that inspired me to show up. And that was the wood shop, you know, and I didn't end up building boats. I didn't end up being a woodworker, right. but it helped me, it helped create, uh, you know, some momentum for me. Right. I, I went out there and I, found inspired people and I started, you know, spend a time around them and learn from them and it led to the next thing. So I guess one thing I would ask people to do is just, if you feel that inspiration and you, for whatever reason, you're not going out there to do that thing, go, go do that yeah. thing. You find other people who are really jazzed about doing their thing. Oh, that's so right. That's so right. Um, <laughs> lead with your, lead with your passion. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to put that on a coffee mug or something. Maybe the next swag, it's going to be like, you know, lead with passion. <laughs> Jesse Bloom, Bloom. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Okay. Um, all right. Well, uh, so besides you, uh, of course, uh, who is someone that we should follow or listen to, or, or like, who's who's someone's passion that we need to hear? You know, I, I've I've used his name so many times. I got to go back to Will Allen. You know, Will Will, Allen. yeah, Will uh, is a literal literal giant of a man, um, former basketball player and. Uh, you know, whether or not you have any interest in urban farming or gardening, this guy is, is, is inspirational. So, uh, look up Will Allen. He's done a bunch of talks. Um, they've done a bunch of videos on him, uh, and, um, learn about somebody who really, um, moved the needle when it came to, you know, ur- urban farming becoming a thing that is more recognizable in the United States. Fantastic. Yeah. Well, Jesse, thank you so much for for chatting with me. Um, this has been a pleasure. Um, we got to get to Rudy John again. 
I'd love that. I'd love to bring it back. We gotta, we gotta get together again. Yeah. Um, and uh, I need to meet Aaron. I feel like I feel like I need to meet Aaron as well. Uh, so anyway, uh, thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Um, Thanks, ben. Cheers. GreenHeartSC.org. Um, go check them out. Go visit the the urban farm on Thursdays. Get some get some good veggies. Yeah. Thanks, man. Take care. This has been an episode of For the Better. For more information, episodes, or to be a guest on the podcast, visit ForTheBetterPodcast.com. Thanks all. Be well.